Hi, welcome back. Uh, yeah, we're starting right on time, and we will try to end right on time. So we only have an hour, and I want to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. And an hour is not enough time <laughs> for our next guest. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about in this conversation is what it means to live a life in the arts. And I, I can't think of anyone better to talk about that than this guest who has lived something like four complete A-list lives in the arts. This is an enormously deep and broad and well-rounded set of musical careers and also incredibly gracious with her time. So in addition to this talk, she'll be doing a session on analog recording techniques and did a session yesterday on hidden hearing loss from a neurological perspective. This is the kind of breadth we're talking about here. Um, so please welcome Susan Rogers. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Dennis. It's really nice to be here. Thank you all in advance for attending. I hope that I can give you information that you will find useful. So, you've done a lot of things. Mm. You worked for Prince for a number of years, and now you're teaching at Berkeley, teaching engineering and production, and you're running a music cognition laboratory yes. there. If I ask you some question like, what are you working on right now? It's probably a dozen different things, right? Uh, the, Berkeley is a teaching college, not a research institution. So I do a lot of teaching. All of our, our Berkeley faculty do. So I'll teach, typically I teach advanced production techniques, record production. I teach the analog tape class because the kids love it. Uh, <laughs> the people are demanding it. Uh, I teach music cognition, which is the study of your brain on music. It's the study of music and emotions, music and personality, like why do certain personality types get attracted to certain kinds of music? Um, it includes music and memory, music and evolution, music and development, and then basic pitch perception, timbre perception. I also teach psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is the nuts and bolts of your auditory system and how pressure waves in the air are converted into a neural signal, which then becomes music. Uh, so it's a wide variety. It, you mentioned this, this thing about how different personality types are attracted to different kinds of music. Is there an easy answer for that? Like, why are they? There's not an easy answer, and it's not my area of research, but I read the research that's out there and I interpret it in class. I think that's what all scientists do. Essentially, the music that we like is driven by our, it's really driven by our genes as well as our environment. So gene expression gives rise to certain personality traits and that's inherited and it's relatively stable throughout your lifetime. So if you're an introvert, you're probably always going to be an introvert and an extrovert is always going to be an extrovert. Although you can learn the behaviors of the other type you are what you are. So personality types uh, include whether you're liberal or conservative, whether you're a risk taker or you're, uh, you like to play it safe, whether you like to go along with the crowd or whether you like to be alone. So that influences the kind of music you like because it influences the kind of music listening experience you want to have. Uh, in general, very conservative people tend to like pop music very yeah, liberal people tend to be more thrill-seeking and they will go out and look for uh, different kinds of music, more art music. Uh, some people like rhythmic music that they dance to. Other people like cerebral music and they pay more attention to the lyrics. Uh, all of us are sort of different types depending on what we need music to do for us. This is fascinating. Did, did the things that you learned about neuroscience and that you are learning during your research validate things that you had figured out as a record producer? Kind of, yeah. When we're in the music business, we have these ideas of what's going to work. You're in the studio, you're with a client, you're making a record, and you don't know. You don't know. No one does. No formula can predict whether or not something's going to be a hit. I know that there are algorithms that attempt to predict whether something's going to be a hit. All that's doing is analyzing the component parts of a hit. But being attracted to music is like having a certain appetite, an appetite for food, for example. So one day you're in the mood for pizza, and the next day you're in the mood for a sandwich. And on certain occasions you want a very special meal, and on other occasions you just want 
to get it done. <laughs> just give me some calories and let me just move on. Some of your friends might be real foodies and they're very particular about where they eat. Other of your friends, they don't care. They'll eat the same thing every day. So um, with music, we knowing like the particulars of it does not give you predictive power over what people are going to do at any given day and time. And people are always changing. Their appetites are changing. I mean, more specifically, were there ever certain experiences where you were, you read something in an article and you said, oh yeah, that explains why this record I made didn't sell or this record I made did sell? That definitely happens. <laughs> For example, uh, I mixed a record by a wonderful artist from New Zealand and her name is Julia Darling. The record is called Figure Eight. And what a brilliant record. My old friend and colleague Tony Berg was the producer. T-Bone Burnett had worked on it. Julia Darling was 21 years old. She was beautiful and smart, incredible. This record was great. And we all thought it's going to be a huge hit. But there was a problem. Julia Darling was 21 years old, beautiful, brilliant, and nothing like the average 21-year-old. Her lyrics were way more cerebral and more mature. And 21-year-olds are like, what are we going to do with this? This is the girl in school who was smarter than everyone else. We don't want to hang out with her. So <laughs> as great as Julia Darling was, her record was produced by men in their 40s. Men in their 40s don't know what it's like to be a 21-year-old girl. And Julia Darling was already an outlier. What would have worked in hindsight was if Julia had teamed up with producers who kept it much more simple. Then you could have taken this complex raw material, very complex, put it in a simple package and sell it. But you can't take complex material, make it even more complex, and then think you're going to sell it. It just doesn't work like that. So yeah, in hindsight, some of these things if I had known about it, uh, I would have been better informed. I, I, I hope that when I teach my students about why people bond to music and what people like in music, I'm helping to teach them that they're never going to make a record that appeals to everyone. You really need to do yourself a favor and know your audience. Know what sort of food people want in front of them before you serve them. Know who's coming to your restaurant, so to speak. Serve them what they're expecting to eat with a little bit of variety and flavor, and you'll do better than if you just throw it out there and hope that it sticks. One of the things we talked about was that you, a lot of your research has been about how musicians and non-musicians hear differently. Yeah. This is, can you expand on this? Well, this was a huge eye-opener to me. I didn't realize, um, but it's been well established now, that musical training in childhood develops the auditory path from the cochlea all the way up to the cortex. So musicians are faster and have a, a greater degree of accuracy when it comes to processing sounds, all kinds of sounds, music, speech, environmental noise. The musician's brain or the processing circuitry has developed like an athlete's body develops. So just like a professional athlete is gonna have quick reflexes, great balance, good muscle control, a professional musician who studied music as a child is going to be better able to recognize subtleties in sounds. I thought, because I had been in the music business for all these years making records, that I would be great when I got in that psychoacoustics lab booth, that I'd be great at hearing small differences in sound. And um, my ego went because I was the same as every non-musician. I knew what to listen for but I still didn't have the processing architecture that a musician has. So it's important for record makers to understand that the vast majority of music listeners are non-musicians. So the kids at Berkeley who've taken a lot of music theory classes, they know it's really impressive to make this one impressive voicing over that voicing and to do this, you know, triple galuli on the snare drum or whatever. <laughs> For most musicians, it's going <laughs> right over their heads. The kids hear things that I just don't notice it. They notice these little things. To me, all I notice is, how'd the song feel? How's it feel? 
Does the singer sound bored? Does the singer sound engaged? Uh, can I feel the musicians dig in? Uh, is this groove boring or not? That's all I hear. And that, that can be an asset for a record maker, to be able to hear like your average non-musician. But there must be, you must have something on these average non-musicians because you were also able to make those records that sounded amazing to people. You know, I think the only thing I really have is just, I've put in the 10,000 hours, it's probably 100,000 hours of listening to records. When I was a kid, um, and there are many people like this, um, kids who are drawn to music but they don't want to be a musician. They have zero appetite to learn to play an instrument or sing, uh, but they are crazy about records. They are born music listeners. Those are the people who become record producers. Sometimes they become A&R executives or they become DJs. Uh, they, they have a relationship with music, but it's not learning chords and scales. It's, it's the art of the record. It's uh, an ear for a multi-timbral signal. It's an ear for music as a whole. And we get really good at hearing performance gestures, such as timing and uh, phrasing in vocals. Uh, I hear this way better than my students do. I can describe to them the effectiveness of a vocal in terms of its relationship to the beat. Like in this section, we want the singer to be a little bit ahead of the beat. In this section, we want the singer to be a little bit behind the beat. When the singer's ahead of the beat and the snare's a little bit behind the beat, it gives this feel. When you swap that relationship and you push that snare and you pull that vocal back, it gives the song a different subtext. So that's a kind of listening, the expertise of performance gestures that's probably similar to an orchestra conductor where you're listening to these sections and you're pulling up and pushing down just what you want to hear, selfishly. So you mentioned earlier that this is a kind of neural wiring that happens with people who started young. And I'm Usually. sure there are a number of people in the audience who are like, oh, crap, I started late. But all is not lost for them, right? Yeah, that's true. So what we're talking about when we talk about the musician's brain in the sciences, we're talking about someone who started formal, musical training, not just playing around on the piano by ear, but formal musical training, practice with isolated pitches, chords, scales, and just you know running through the rudiments, starting before the age of about 14 and continuing for about five years or more. So I had a couple of piano lessons when I was a kid for a few years. It never took. In order to get the brain changes, the morphological changes that happen in the musician's brain, you need to have started young and to have kept going for a long time. But science tends to group people according to exemplars. In the middle are all these people who started later, or maybe people who started young and didn't play quite as, as often. There is that gray area in the middle where these folks have higher acuity than most non-musicians, but not quite the same profile as someone who's been playing since they were this, this big. And you're strictly talking neurologically. There are many people in this group who still make amazing music. Oh, exactly. So the scientific term for musician is very different from the street term or the practical, colloquial use of the word musician. So some of the greatest musicians that I've known have had no formal musical training. I don't believe Prince ever had any formal musical training, although he kind of trained himself. He sat at dad's piano and he, he just practiced on his own. He started very young. No doubt he would have had a musician's brain, but Lisa Coleman, Wendy Melvoin, who started when they were in diapers, would have a different profile a different, um, slightly different architecture for processing music, but music involves more than just your auditory processing. It involves your creativity. It, it involves original thought. It involves your artistry. And there are people who've never had a music lesson, but who know art and who know how to take a thing that makes sound and make art with it. And that has nothing to do with the scientific definition of a musician brain. So I want to back up in your career a number of years. You, you had a successful career as an audio tech, mm -hmm. and then as an engineer, and then as a producer, all at a very high level. And it was that you had an enormously successful record stunt with the Bare Naked Ladies as a producer, 
which made you enough money so that you could then leave the music business. Yeah. And this is really interesting. I think a lot of people aim for this world where they have a hit record so that they can then make the next hit record. And for you, it was an exit path. Yeah. Can you explain why you chose to leave? That's not all that uncommon. Um, when I was working with T-Bone Burnett and with uh, Tony Berg and with other producers who were a few years older than I, in their 40s, they talked about it. They talked about it. Tony is still in it. Tony's in his 60s and, and still loves it as much as he loved it when he was in his 20s. But I remember T-Bone Burnett was, was questioning how much longer he could go. He was being interviewed by someone and the re interviewer asked him, um, so do you listen to college radio? <laughs> this was years ago and he goes, no, I'm 47 years old. There'd be something wrong with me if I listened to college radio. <laughs> So when you're in your 40s, you might start to feel it. I just hung out recently with the producer Greg Wells, and Greg Wells has been, you know, he's been successful for 25, 30 years. And Greg says, I'm 49 years old. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. And what you're feeling is that you're young enough to want to do new things. And you're old enough that you've had some success. So you're asking yourself, what else could I do that would scratch my itches creatively? Uh, and that's, that's where I was. I was, I was approaching my mid-40s and I was recognizing, yeah, I've kind of done all this and I really like it, but I've also dreamed about having a life as a scientist and I think I'd like to give that a shot. And then I, I just happened to have this hit record that made it possible. Financially possible. Financially possible, yeah. So if it hadn't been for that, you'd still be making records to make a living. Probably. Right. But um, I had my hit record as a producer. I'd had hit records as an engineer, many of them, or as a mixer, but back in the olden days, when, you had, when we sold music instead of just downloading it, back in the olden days, if you had points on a record, as, as producers did, and that record went platinum, well, that's a six-figure royalty check. And if that record goes triple platinum, or if it sells five million, like Bare Naked Ladies did, that's a big chunk of money. And so you can either pay off your mortgage, or I should say you could have, I, I know the sales numbers are different today, but you could have paid off your mortgage, you could have built a studio, or do what I did and quit your job. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> So sell seven figures worth of records, you'll be fine. Um, and so you went into, the, into science. Yes. Right, but still tied to the ear. Well, um, I'm very interested in consciousness, and I wanted to study uh, consciousness in other species. I, my dream was to be a cognitive ethologist. I wanted to literally study pigs. I, I wanted to study the brain of, of pigs. Because it's the only intelligent animal whose brain we don't study. All the other uh, intelligent animals, we study them. Dolphins and apes and things like that. We were interested in their intelligence, crows and wolves. But the pig is a really smart animal and we eat it. And uh, that doesn't seem right to me. So I, I wanted to explore its intelligence. But because I was earning my degree very late in life, a wise man said to me, your science career is gonna be really, really short. You should go with what you know. You can make a contribution to this new emerging study of music cognition. And he was right. Uh, I, I really, really enjoy the conversation going between the art of music and the science of music and going back and forth. And it turns out, to my surprise, it's the exact same thing, but in a different direction. So. In the sciences, you've got millions of scientists who are all over the world working their way inward toward a common point of what it means to be human. It doesn't matter if you're researching the motor system or the olfactory system, how we smell things or how hair grows. We're working toward, here's what it means to be human. And in the arts, we're working in the opposite direction. We're taking what it means to be human and exploding it into millions of different records. So it's the same journey. It's just looking outward as the artist does or looking inward as the scientist does, but it's the same path. And it's extremely creative to be in the sciences. It's extremely creative. 
You, you, there was an amazing quote when we talked before that you said you were looking forward to retirement so that you can really get to work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So right now uh, I teach and that keeps me really busy and I love the students. I couldn't possibly love the kids more. I love teaching. I love the conversation because they're making music. They're making records now. That kind of keeps me in it a little bit and I really like that. But the work I really am looking forward to I won't be able to do until I retire. I, I just really want to study and write and, and contribute to, to the sciences because I really enjoy that. Let's shift gears a little and talk about Prince. Yes. I think some of you have heard of Prince. Um, when we emailed before, I was sensitive to the fact that you, you've moved on. You've had a very different, a series of very different lives now. And I've also read a lot of interviews of yours where you only talk about Prince. There's no discussion of your work as a neuroscientist at all. And so I was like, hey, if we talk about Prince, is that okay? I know that's not really what you're doing. And I just want to read a quote from your mail. You wrote, most of us who worked with Prince feel privileged to share our stories. We want the next generation to know how extraordinary he was and that there is more to uncover. Mm. I think that's super gracious. <clears throat> it's really impressive. So what, what more is there to uncover? What don't we know? Yeah, you... This audience, to a greater or lesser degree, you know his name, you know that he was an important artist. Prince wanted to be remembered as an important artist. He wanted to be known as one. He didn't want to be known as a man. He didn't want to be known as a mere mortal, as a human being, as what he actually was. And we all who worked for him or knew him, we respected that. So we didn't talk about him as a human because it's not what he wanted. This wasn't some weird twisted ego. This was the protection that he needed to be able to work. He needed a barrier between his own psyche and the work he did. And the only thing he wanted people to see was the work he did. He was naturally shy, so he used that to his advantage by saying, I don't give interviews. It wasn't because he was an asshole, it's because he didn't want to talk about himself. He really didn't. That's the person he was. So now that he's gone, I think it's important for those of us who knew him to talk about the other side of him, which was how great he was as a human being. I mean, of course he had flaws and he made mistakes. When he was a young man, he made a lot of people angry at him. But he was, he was brave. He was generous with his employees, he treated us well. For example, when we went on the Purple Rain tour, I think there were 85 people on that tour, if I recall correctly, 85 people. And it was my very first tour, the Purple Rain tour. We were out for nine months. And I remember the, the lighting crew and the sound crew, the guys from Shoko and from, um, get the name of the other company, they were blown away that Prince gave every member of that crew their own, his, his or her own hotel room. So on typical rock star tours, the crew always would double up. The riggers, the drivers, everybody. Everybody doubled up, at least two people in a room. But Prince wanted people to be happy. He spent the extra money to give each guy his own room so you could have your privacy. And the road crew was telling me, that's just not done. People just aren't that generous. He was that way in big ways and in small ways. Um, we'd have a big arena show in the evening, and during the day, we'd take a small truck, and we'd load it up with extra equipment, and we'd go play a hospital for sick children, for people who couldn't come, kids, you know, who, who were sick in the hospital. They couldn't come to the show. Uh, he would do that on one condition. No press, no publicity. He didn't want the fame from it. He just wanted to play to these kids. And we would go to uh, schools for handicapped children, kids who couldn't come out to a big arena show, and we would set up the scarves and the flowers and the lights, and we'd do a full set, not just one or two songs, a full set for these kids on the condition that it be kept quiet. Uh, and, and there are countless examples of who this man was. Uh, it's... We lost someone, not just important, but we lost someone really good, uh, a, re a really good man. And there's, because he was so quiet, there were a lot of rumors about him out there. And uh, I'll be damned if I'll let his 
memory be one of, oh, he was just some freak. And he was no freak. He was unusual, but he, he was a good man. I mean, in addition to that, there was also the relentless passion for the music, right? Which is why you had, you've used these sort of battle metaphors for talking about your time with him as being a tour of duty and that nobody worked for Prince, they were deployed with Prince <laughs> because of the 20 hour right. work days. But this was making music the whole time, right? Yeah, if he was awake and not on a date, which and those dates were pretty short, uh, <laughs> really short dates, meeting a girl, digging her to the studio, uh, hanging out with her privately for a little while, and then it was back to the studio, so she'd get bored and she'd leave. So if he wasn't on a date and he wasn't on a business call, he was making music, and we made music every day. I was his full-time employee, so if we were not on tour, we did rehearsals during the day, and then we recorded at night. Um, if we were on tour, he would, this guy would play a four-hour sound check often, not a 15-minute sound check like most rock stars do. He'd get on stage for four hours just because, you know, it's a stage and there's instruments and there's a PA, so why not just get up there and play? Play for hours, take the mandatory dinner break while they have doors, the audience comes in, and this is like in a, you know, 14,000-seat arena, play a two-and-a-half-hour show, and then he'd get off the stage close to midnight and now it's time for the night to begin. We would either go to an after party and he would play the after party till the sun came up, or we would go to a recording studio and we would record all night until the last possible minute when we had to get on a plane or on a bus to go to the next city. You sleep on the plane, you sleep on the bus, you get to the next city, you get on stage and you start sound check all over again. That's what we did. That was normal life. If you're awake, you're making music. And I think he felt like, I'm young, I have a record deal, I've got a band, I got money. What else should I be doing? This is what I should be doing. So that's what he did. Um, is it the, was it the case that he had to work because he knew that he had a limited amount of time at his creative peak, or was it the case that all the music was there and he had only a limited amount of time to get it out? I don't know. I, he, he had the strongest work ethic of any musician I've ever known. And I've known a lot, because I've been in this business since 1978, so that's almost 40 years now. I've never known anyone who had a stronger work ethic. I think he felt obligated to use the opportunity that he'd been given. He got signed to a record deal when he was like 18 or 19, something like that. He was really young. You're a teenager from North Minneapolis who grew up in a poor family, who got kicked out of your home when you were 14 years old and you have to go live with your friend. I mean, if you find yourself with a record deal, you're gonna make the most of that deal for as long as you can. And his brain was, uh, he was so creative and he was so gifted musically that he could do a lot over a long period of time. And that was actually, it was his extraordinary strength, but it was also a weakness. He would have made more creative art had he slowed down a little bit, had he worked with others, he never had a producer, he always produced himself. If he had um, been willing to compromise with other musical minds, his mu music might have been more nuanced or more varied. It wasn't. He was what he was. And he also played everything on those records, right? He played everything except the horns. Yeah, except he the horns. would program the drum machine or he'd play the acoustic drums starting with just that one instrument, and then he'd come in and I'd hand him the bass, and he'd play the bass, and he'd put that down, and then he'd either go to the keys or he'd pick up the guitar. He'd play all the parts, do the vocals, because this was analog tape, so he'd sing his lead vocals, sing his backing vocals, add the final stuff. I'd be mixing it as the song was coming together, and usually a day later, uh, it would be done. The song would be done, we'd print it, and then we'd move on to another song. You had some examples that you wanted to play. Yeah, um, I put a few things on a playlist. You guys have all heard Prince songs, but I wanted to um, just show you a couple examples of the kind of musical aptitude we're talking about. When you're in the studio with someone who can play that well, that means 
they can play for a long time without running out of ideas or without running out of aptitude. So this is live. It's live uh, from First Avenue, the club in Minneapolis. It was his birthday show, June 7th, 1984. It's just the intro to Erotic City, but listen to him on guitar. Let's just, just listen to him on guitar. This is live. It's just a board mix. <laughs> Up. It's amazing. You've stressed a number of times in your interviews that he was not a perfectionist. He right. was just a virtuoso. Right, right. So, and there was an amazing quote that I'm going to paraphrase and get wrong, where he said, Michael Jackson is perfect. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. Is that accurate? Yeah, I remember him saying to me once, uh, I was complaining because we were going so fast and I thought, you know, the sounds could be better and uh, this is kind of late in my time with him and this is when people were starting to use the SSL console a little bit more and I said, you know, Prince, why don't we like use automation? Why don't we try one of those new SSL consoles? Why don't we try something new? And he asked why and I said, well, you know, because it could sound a lot better and he said... <laughs> He said, we, we don't sound like those other guys. That's what makes us special. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, we sound worse. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he didn't care about stuff like that. He, uh, I, I will take a quote from the sciences. Creativity equals original plus useful. So originality, just for the sake of being original, is it, it didn't matter if, if nobody wants it. Let's go back to the food analogy. Anybody can go into the kitchen and take some weird ingredients and put them all together. And yeah, it's original, but if nobody likes it, it's no good. So he had that perfect blend of original thought, but he knew how to make music that was functional. And he himself could not have functioned if he'd been obsessing over every little detail. His work was gesture sketches. It, his music would come out like a sneeze. It was just bam, 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 bam. Michael Jackson's music was massaged and carefully controlled and obsessed over. Both of them reached the same point, which is the peak of the charts in the 80s. They both reach the same point, but as very different types of artists with different methodologies. If you did anything that slowed Prince down, you were out of there. You had to just keep letting him take his long, his fast method to get there. It's amazing. I mean, you've told some stories in the past about mixes that were technically broken, like the ballad of Dorothy Parker was recorded on a, on a uh, recording console that didn't work, yeah. right? And he didn't care. He just yeah. needed to get the song printed. He didn't care. <laughs> and that taught me another important lesson that uh, people are not buying sounds, people are buying music. They're not buying what I do as an engineer. Uh, what I do is, is I'm, I'm hitching the wagon of technology to the star of this guy's ideas. So the technology is merely facilitating his thinking. Now that can work when the thinking is genius. When the thinking is average, then the sounds have to be extraordinary. And this has been true in the history of music. When new music comes along, whether it's EDM or when punk came along in the 70s, punk sounded like shit. But it was great because the ideas were new. The Ramones didn't spend a lot of time, neither did the Sex Pistols, getting those records to sound good. People are buying this new idea. But when you're doing classic music, whether it's classic country, classic rock, Older forms of music where, the, uh, where people are buying is the nostalgia, because the form is, is well known, then the sounds have to be great, which is why if you go to Nashville in the US, you're gonna find the best session musicians and the best recording engineers. They're doing the classic music, so the technique has to be brilliant. You've talked about how 
at the end of your time with Prince, you had to unlearn and that this was a difficult thing because your experience so far had been through this, through the ears of what Prince wanted. But th there's more to it. This idea of unlearning Prince also means learning how to work with mortals again. With right? other people, right. So all of us who left Prince, I've talking, uh, I've talking, I've spoken with some of his engineers who worked with him later in his career as well, and we all say the same thing. Prince would spoil you. You know, after, after Prince, you, you try to not feel disdain for a person who needs to take all day <laughs> to do a guitar part. You're thinking, why do you have a record deal? <laughs> because I know people who could, you know. And, and, and you have to, it takes a minute because you're wrong, they're right, they have a record deal. Someone saw value in their artistry. Their technique isn't there, but their ideas are there. So all of us uh, had to get humble, and we had to learn that there are many, many ways of making music. And uh, you don't have to follow the rules necessarily. You don't have to be Prince. Not many people are. But there are other, other ways, and, and that it, that's how most people make music. And those, many of those ideas are brilliant and genius. So yeah, it, it, took a, it took a little while. We had to, we had to get humble. And, you, and then you talk a, a bit about how you, you're sort of reopening your eyes. The real learning that you had was after Prince with this band, Gaggy Ta. Yeah. Um, after I left Prince, because I was so used to how he and I made records, I didn't know how to make records with other people. I had never been an assistant engineer. I started my career as an audio technician repairing consoles and tape machines. So... Um, I didn't know how to engineer the way other people engineered. And people would hire me to mix records, and I did okay. But the only sounds I really knew were Prince sounds. And I, I was really... I would have been in trouble if I hadn't done something um, quick. I recognized that what I needed to learn was something about music that I didn't know. And then one day I was in the offices of... Uh, Kevin Lafferty was his name. He was an A&R man at uh, Warner Brothers Records. And he played me a cassette by a duo named Gegita, and it blew me away. And I recognized, whatever it is these guys know about music, that's it. That's the thing I need to know. Uh, Gegita, er, they were signed to David Byrne's Luwakabop label. The Geggy stood for Greg Kirsten, who uh, is the world's hottest producer right now. Greg just did the last Adele record and got the Grammy for Producer of the Year and Record of the Year and Song of the Year and, and all that. And Greg just did the new Foo Fighters record and Beck and uh, he, 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 he's, his career's on fire. So that was the Geggy. And then Ta was Tommy Jordan. Uh, Tommy Jordan has been called one of the five most creative people in the music business. And those two guys combined taught me something about music that I didn't know. And it, it blew my mind. And thanks to what I learned from those guys, I was able to have a career. Thanks to those guys. What did you learn? Because <laughs> I think we'd like to know <laughs> yeah, how to have a career. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, uh, Tommy had, uh, he, was a, he was a composition major at Oberlin. Greg studied jazz piano at the New School in New York. When they came together, Greg was really young. He was like 22, 23. Tommy was about five years older. And Tommy said it best. Tommy said, what Greg and I want to know is what music is. What it is. So they had all this training and they took all that training and all that craft. They went from, you know, being babies, being naive. They worked their way up to having all this training. And they turned around and walked back. Back to what it means to make music as a three-year-old playing with, you know, a little xylophone or pots and pans. What it means to make music if you're 97 years old and you really want to dance. You really want to sing, but your body doesn't work like that anymore. What it means to make music if you're a dog or a monkey. What it make, means to make music if you're tone deaf. Prior to Gegita, they had a band called Koku, and Koku was a 10-piece band. It stood for Collaborating Cultures. A 10-piece band consisting of five great musicians, Tommy Jordan, Greg Kirsten, John McKnight, Denny Moynihan, and... Um, I forget who the last guy was, Richie somebody. 
five trained musicians and five non-musicians. And the rule was, you couldn't come to a rehearsal until you'd played a gig with them. So you had to play a gig with them first as a non-musician, then you could come to rehearsal. And if you came to rehearsal, then you could join the band. <laughs> so they had a woman on stage like with a typewriter and answering the phone, and they had a guy on stage with a, a, a bottle of water. They once brought a homeless guy in from the street because he wanted to sing along, so they brought the homeless guy in and they had him do lead vocals. <laughs> They were interested in how music is an expression of life. They wanted to make music from life. And that taught me that's what music is. It's an expression of life. And as Tommy put it, life is perfect and it's full of mistakes. It's clean and it's dirty. It smells sweet and it stinks. It is dressed up and it looks like a slob. And that's what music should be. It should have all of those elbows and mistakes and the dirt under its nails, and it should cause you to wrinkle your nose and go, ooh, uh, because that's what life is. Uh, and and once, once I got that from those guys, then I could take it from there. So I, I had learned uh, a lot about being, making music at the highest level, the highest level of the pop charts with Prince. I had learned about making music at the gut bucket level of these two guys. And then from there, um, the fear goes away. That's when you realize, oh shit, this is easy. The making of music is easy. Selling it is another story altogether, but making music is not something that you look out there in the world to discover how to do. Music isn't something you pick off a tree, like fruit. Your music has been growing in you your whole life. You don't look out there for it, you look in here. So you, if you're going to make music, you have to bring it up from inside you and figure out a way through your hands, your ears, your eyes, your brain, to have it come up out of you and out there into the world. And then you're, most of the hard work is done. Now it's out there. Now you figure out who likes it, what do they like about it. Now you listen to criticism, that's your best friend. When people tell you they like it, good. It proves that you've done well. When people say, this sucks, they're either wrong or they're right. If they're right, good. If they're right and your music is bad, good. Now you should go make some different music. And if they're wrong, well, show them that they're wrong. Show them how they're wrong. And, and that makes you defend your work. So criticism will never hurt you. You have to be willing to go out there and take it. This feels like a great segue into the topic that you wanted to talk about expressly, which is what it means to live a life in the arts. Yeah, it takes, um, think of it like a coin. How a coin has a head and a tail. The one side of it is you have to be batshit crazy to think that you can do this. I mean, really, you gotta be a little bit deluded to think, oh yeah, I, I, this is gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be insane to truly believe that. So you have to be crazy. And then the other side of the coin is, you have to be sane enough to say, yeah, I'm gonna give this a try. So, if you're too crazy, we all know these people who are just too very, very gifted, very talented, they make incredible art, but they're just too crazy. They don't have the sanity necessary to navigate this career. And we know people who are too sane. They're too cautious. They don't have an appetite for risk. They want to be able to see the future before it's ever even happened. They want to plan out every step. They want to take years of school, in some cases, uh, even though I teach it one, I don't know, school's okay, but you got to be out there, you got to be doing stuff. Um, so you need that sanity and you need that insanity. Those are the people who succeed. Um, you also have to uh, understand reality. You have to think of yourself in terms of um, a young fish in a big pond. Anything that's really worth having, it's going to be surrounded by the big fish. 
So you can go to Los Angeles or New York or London or Berlin, you can go to the big cities of the world and you can compete in those big markets. Or you can say, you know, I really don't like those big fish and I don't want to be anywhere near them. You can make music in the small markets. Go to a smaller place and make music there. Uh, Tommy Jordan, always quotable, taught me another thing that was really, really useful. It depends, your success, I should say, depends on what your definition of success is. Uh, my brothers are successful, very successful men, because they have good marriages and they have good children. They have good jobs, blue collar workers, you know, they work with their hands. They have a good, that's a good life. That's what they wanted and that's what they got. That's, that's success. Uh, so decide what you want. And if you get that, you're successful. Don't let it, don't let that definition be something like, you know, chart success or money or whatever. Have it be what you want. That's great. Thank you. I, I want to make sure that we give enough time over for questions. There should be a, some mics floating around. Anyone? There's one here, Francis. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was so interesting. Um, my probably my favourite Prince album is Sign of the Times. Uh, I know that you worked on on that record. I just wondered if you could just say a little bit about it. Um, obviously, you could probably talk about it for many hours. So, um, but. It, it, to me, it's a very, it's a really unique and kind of incredible record, especially the use of the fair light. The sort of the, that's like one of the real cause of it for me. But if, if you've got anything to say about that, I'd love to hear it. That record, I think, that was a difficult birth, the birth of that record for Prince. Um, I was fortunate that I was with him from Purple Rain through Sun of the Times because on Purple Rain, he didn't know how it was going to go. He thought it was maybe going to be successful and it was great when it was. Then after Purple Rain, everything changed. So Around the World in a Day was the last of the innocents for Prince because uh, we made Around the World in a Day before we even finished the Purple Rain tour. He was still an innocent on Around the World in a Day. On Parade, the next record, uh, he was having to rethink his artistry so that he could keep the streak going. But by the time we got to Sign of the Times, he uh, had the problem of success. And Tommy Jordan used to always say, the problems of success are no less than the problems of failure. They're just different problems, but they're still problems. So Prince had the problems of success, meaning he didn't know what to do next artistically. Uh, he was still a young man, he was in his 20s. His band was breaking up. Wendy and Lisa ultimately left, so did Bobby Z. Uh, his engagement to Susanna Melvoin was breaking off and he didn't know where his career was going to go. And then on top of all that, this was 1987, so it was clear at that point that rap the new wave in music was gonna take over. So he was in a tight spot. And when you're in that tight spot, you just uh, look down inside yourself and you bring up whatever comes up. And what came up on that record was darker than what he had been before. Songs that were more serious and sadder. He wanted very much to get his black audience back, the R&B radio, um, and he was only partially successful. Um, he threw it out there. And, and hoped that it would be successful. But after a couple of other attempts, originally it was supposed to be a triple album. Warner Brothers would not give him permission to do that because it's too expensive to manufacture. Nobody put out triple albums in those days. So they wouldn't let him do it. And uh, prior to that, it had been some dance albums. He was thinking of Dream Factory and Crystal Ball. But he wasn't in a dancey mood. He was in a little bit of a dark, introspective mood. Um, I didn't, there wasn't the same excitement around that record as there had been um, around Purple Rain or around Parade even, but the critics consider that, that both Purple Rain and Sign of the Times are his two great masterpieces. It was a masterpiece. Hi, yeah. Um, I, I listened to your uh, kind of uh, tales of, of working so fast with Prince. Um, and coming from an engineering background myself, that sounds like an incredibly frustrating experience as, as well as obviously enlightening and, and inspiring with working with him. Um, could you share, not to be 
too down, but some of those frustrations of working on so much music that then got shelved or put in the vault and never see the light of day, kind of how frustrating was that for you? It was hard to know what he was thinking. So I came to him as his fan. I had had all his records. I had loved him from the first time I heard him and had seen him play live a few times before I went to work for him. So I was his fan right there in the room with him as he's right here making music. His fan is doing that recording. So when he would make music, I'd be thinking, oh, it's so exciting. I can't wait to hear what the fans have to say about this. I can't wait until we go on the road and play this live, and this is great, and this next record is gonna be great. It's so funky, it's gonna be great, or this is so innovative, or this is so melodic, or just whatever it was. And then when we were cutting the record together, the song that I thought was so great wouldn't go on there. So often. And that was a little bit frustrating at first. You'd, you'd ask yourself, what could he possibly be thinking? And there were, there were lesser songs that made it on there that I didn't think were as good. It really took years before I understood what it was he was thinking. I have a, I have a better grip on it now, but I think ultimately the songs that he opted to release contained the lyrical message that he wanted to say. Um, funk stuff he could do in his sleep. So if the lyric wasn't especially interesting, that would go in the vault. But when the lyric was personal or deep or unique, uh, that would be the stuff he would be inclined to release. We had to, we all had to trust him. He was the leader. Uh, there was only one alpha male there. Uh, it was not a democracy. It was definitely a, a hierarchy. So we learned to trust him, but we would get very frustrated as well. Sometimes he'd ask my opinion, what I thought. Sometimes, I mean, I'd always tell him the truth. Sometimes I made bad choices. Uh, and other times, you know, maybe it was okay. He asked me what I thought about releasing If I Was Your Girlfriend as a single, and I'm the one who pushed him to do it, and that was a mistake. That, that was a mistake. That should not have been a single. I thought it was so innovative because it's a lyric uh, the lyric is, is a man wondering what it would be like if he was his sweetheart's girlfriend instead of boyfriend. Like, what if we were just friends? Like, would you be more, you know, close with me? And I'd never heard a man say that before, so I thought it was a good choice. But for black radio in the United States, which is the audience he was hoping to win back, nah, not into it. It didn't play well. It didn't play, didn't play well. Oh, well, another mistake. Um, to go back to uh, science of music, um, what do you think of this idea that um, music is like the evolutionary precursor to language, um, that it, you know, it like goes back before language and to sort of is our bridge back to the primates? Do you uh, subscribe to that? That makes really good sense. The folks who are looking at music and evolution are suggesting that in our early ancestry, we used rhythm and pitch changes to signify both what we were feeling and then ultimately to signal what we were thinking or what we knew. So there was probably an early music language that was in between music as we know it today and language as we know it. Uh, evidence for that comes from Robert Seyfarth, uh, yeah, Robert Seyfarth and Dorothy Cheney, husband and wife team, and they were looking at vervet monkeys, and this is awesome. So the vervet monkeys, they're social and they live in the trees, and the monkeys have, uh, they use pitch changes to tell the other monkeys where the predator is coming from. So when the pitch goes, ah, uh, like that, it means the predator is like a hawk or an eagle up in the sky. If the pitch change goes down, ah, uh, it means the predator is down on the ground like a tiger. And if it just goes, and goes it means it's a snake coming through the trees. So the monkeys will be sitting in the trees, minding their own business, doing what they do. The lookout monkey sees a predator. He gives the pitch change. The other monkeys take off. What that means is that you have to have a mind that was evolved enough to know that that other monkey over there knows something that you don't know and you have to be smart enough to believe him. So you have to have an auditory system that can, that can recognize pitch changes, and you have to have a social system that can respond 
to the information that is in a pitch change. Uh, it's called theory of mind, but knowing that another animal has a mind that you don't have. That was probably how music evolved. Humans have this big brain, we got really good at it. We started, uh, you know, you're, you're the, an ancient cave woman and your baby is walking toward the edge of the cliff. If you go, ah, it means danger. And if baby is evolved enough to recognize that, that baby is going to survive. And if baby doesn't have the auditory capacity to recognize that, baby goes over the cliff. Uh, this is, this is an, a fun fact, I think, that the students enjoy, so I might as well share it with you. Uh, men and women have evolved to like certain qualities in the voice of the opposite gender. So women have evolved to like men with a deep chest voice. Men have a deep chest voice because, they're, uh, because they have an Adam's apple. They have an Adam's apple because through puberty, when you're e expressing testosterone, it lengthens the vocal cords, makes them twice as long, which is why a man's voice is an octave lower than a woman's. Human beings are one of only four species, I believe, to exhibit that kind of sexual dimorphism in the voice. If a horse whinnies or a cat meows or a dog barks, you can't tell if it's male or female but you can tell a man's voice from a woman's voice in human form. So anyway, women like men with that chest voice. Men like women with a soft, breathy voice. It's very soft. The reason is, the man with the chest voice, the subtext is that he's powerful. He can suck in a full lung full of air and go out there and kill that mastodon <laughs> and bring it home for supper. And the woman with the breathy voice can soothe your children and take care of them and help them fall asleep. But the mom who's got a voice like this <laughs> is going to frighten your poor children and they'll probably fall off the cliff. <laughs> so uh, we... Uh, Everything is the way it is because it got that way. So our music is the way it is because this is the sweet spot for tempo. We humans prefer tempos in the range of uh, 100 to 120 beats per minute. It's the easiest to dance to. And we like our musical octaves, our melodies, to have a, a certain pitch range, not too narrow, not too wide. Narrow melodies with uh, narrow interval changes sound angry. Very tight little minor seconds, minor thirds, sound angry, those small ranges. But the big, broader interval ranges sound happy. Our music uh, is very much like our language. When people hear a new classical composition, um, brand new classical composition with much better than chance accuracy, they can identify the native language of the composer. They can say that piece of music was a German composer, that one was French, that one was English, that one was Italian, because music kind of mimics the social cues that we put out there through our language. That's a long-winded answer, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm super sad that we have to roll it up. Do we have time for one more? One more. Okay, one more. Hi, thank you for sharing so much. Um, I would like to thank you for encouraging if I was your girlfriend, because I heard it reinterpreted by TLC oh. when I was under 10 years old, and that really inspired me to Great. hear that song that way. But I have a question for you. You've made such strong decisions in your career, and um, I am also a woman producer, and I'm just wondering, what are the things that you do in your life for your own mental fortitude um, that keep you powering through to make these strong decisions to really aid the blooming of other artists? Well, I have to be, um, I want to speak in real practical terms um, because I like, I worship the truth and, I, and, and I, I, I'm always interested in knowing what the truth is. Um, so rather than saying that there's something special about me myself, I am more interested in what it means you know, to be human. What is it about me that allowed me to be successful? And I am not inclined to say it was any of my personal traits. Things that I think assisted my success was, I'm gonna be perfectly blunt here, I'm unmarried and I don't have children. A woman who is single and childless doesn't have anybody else that she has to take care of. I don't know how you do this if you've got children and you're a woman. Society 
puts different demands on men and women and different expectations and different rewards for men and women. Women are rewarded for taking care of children. They're rewarded for keeping a good home and taking care of a husband. So a woman that doesn't have that has got a lot of free time. So I had that. The other thing I had going on is uh, I, I grew up in Southern California. So Los Angeles, it's the home of the music business. If you're a single woman, childless in Los Angeles and you want to be in this business, race is on. You know, you, you can join the pack. Um, it... For men, the, the challenges are similar, but a little bit different. Men are rewarded for being um, myopic. Men are rewarded for ignoring the family in order to work. Women are chastised for ignoring their family in order to work. So there's that. Uh, I have been, uh, because I'm single and childless, I've been extremely selfish. I've done what I wanted to do. Uh, whatever I wanted to do, because nobody depended on me and my choices didn't affect anyone other than me. That selfishness lets you be a kid your whole life. You can just do what's best for you. It comes at a cost. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have children? I like men. I would like to have one. <laughs> I mean, I've always, I've always liked them. I don't have anything against them. I enjoy their company and, and have known and been with some wonderful, wonderful men. But my career has gone better without one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. That's tough, and, that's, uh, and, and the opposite is true for men. M successful men usually have someone keeping the home fires burning, but this, this is just the truth of our world. So yeah, to answer your question, I, I don't think it's anything special. I think it's having the right conditions that allow success, being environmentally in a place that presents opportunities for success, and then having a full can of whoop-ass. <laughs> if you have a full can of whoop-ass, you can go a long way, because you need to be in this business for a long time. I will share it before we wrap up. I will um, end with a quote by George Massenburg, the great producer, engineer. He said, you have to be in this business for seven years before you can call yourself a beginner. That's not an exaggeration before you can call yourself a beginner. This is a long road. Uh, there isn't, the overnight success is not real. Oh, another quote is from Tommy Jordan. Slow growth is real growth. It takes time, so you have to be patient. You have to be willing to go the distance. I wish we had more time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan Thank Rogers. you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.